Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about Fabulous Beasts because we are currently in the middle of kickstarting it and so we are talking everywhere we can and doing all the yelling we can. Um, so there'll be a plug at the end and I'll try to keep the intervening time as relatively plug free. Um, so, Fabulous Beasts, it looks like this. Um, it also looks like the thing out on the table that you walked past as you came in. Um, but here it is larger. So Fabulous Beasts is a cooperative game that is half board game, half video game. Um, you play it by stacking blocks up on that tower there. Um, and as you do so, you add beasts to the world. Those beasts become more fabulous. You make weird and new variants on the beasts. Um, and you sign up for new challenges that make life harder for you. Um, it's made by not just me, but also other people. Um, we're based in London. We're based, like, that's the alleyway outside our office. It's like a huge building in London that's very fancy, and I'm not really sure why we're there. Um, but so, thank you for having us over. Um, the com company is called Sensible Object, and we've been going for a bit over a year now, working on Fabulous Beasts. So, the story of Fabulous Beasts. When we started off, we were going to make a video game that had kind of a... Uh, a real-world controller. Like, like a lot of the games here, it's, it's primarily a video game with a weird controller, and the video game was gonna, gonna be like about like ecosystems, it was gonna be like population modeling. This is an actual screenshot of a spreadsheet I took today from like very early on in the process, and we're like, yes, how can we model ecosystems and manage that, and people will be able to deal with all the complexity of that by stacking pieces up. Um, and, and like we quickly learned that maybe that was too much complexity to give people um, too early on. So we kind of reduced down the amount of complexity and made, made the numbers all smaller and kind of easier to grasp. Um, another thing we were trying to do at the beginning was we were trying to use um, computer vision to work out where the pieces were. So you could do fancy stuff with, hey, if this piece has been put on top of this piece, and then that means something different than it's been put somewhere else. Um, we very quickly um, abandoned the computer vision approach because there's a problem with cameras looking at things, which is that if something's in the way, they can't see them. Um, and, and, then, and then you're like, well, maybe we could have the camera on an arm that rotates around it. <laughs> and then we thought a bit more about it, and then we decided we didn't want to do that, and maybe we'd just use a weight sensor instead. Um, so we kind of fell back a bit and regrouped and we, we came up with this game, um, which is not quite the game you see outside, but has kind of some of the same parts. Um, so this was kind of a relatively complicated game where you had your creatures and they were in competition with other people's, with the, your uh, opponent's creatures. And there was a kind of delicate thing about, you know, again, kind of this ecosystem thing. So you can see you've got mice here and the foxes eat the mice. So if there's no mice, the foxes will start dying out. Um, and if the mice are in competition with, um, say, some crabs that now live on land, then they'll fight amongst each other and one will win out depending on their love value. And we were showing it to a load of people and, and like, so a turning point in this was when we were demoing it at a bar and it was about, I don't know, like 11.30 at night. Um, and this particularly sticks in my head as a bit of feedback that kind of really changed the course of the game. And a drunk girl came up to me and I was trying to explain the game, how to play it to her. She was just like, why is this so complicated? <laughs> and I had a good answer. You know, I, I had all kinds of answers I was giving her. And, and then I went away and I was like, that, that answer wasn't really very convincing. Why is this so complicated? And so we kind of stripped it back to, to pretty much the game you see, you see now. Um, this is Lorenzo playing it, <laughs> looking very cool. <laughs> um, and, so, and so basically we stripped it back so that the focus is on the stacking because it turns out like trying to stack like awkwardly shaped pieces, interesting awkwardly shaped pieces on a tiny platform on top of each other is already kind of an interesting challenge. And it's a challenge that like if you walk up and see people playing it, even before you really know how the game's played, you probably have an opinion as to, you know, whether Lorenzo would be able to put one of those pieces on top of it, you know? If he's trying to put one of the flat bits on top of the green bit there, probably. If he's trying to balance something on top of that blue one, probably not. If he starts doing that, you can already yell at him and tell him he's an idiot without, without needing to know any more of the rules of the game than you're putting a thing on 
don't make it fall over. Um, and so the digital app is there to kind of support that. It's there to make that more exciting. It's there to give you reasons to do things that are a bit dangerous. Um, but it keeps the core of the game there. So um, basically, the, the, the story of the development was just us trying to do something really complicated, realizing that we shouldn't make it that complicated, refining it down to something that's much simpler and easier, um, which in retrospect, you kind of wonder why we had to go through all of that process. But I think we did, probably, hopefully. Um, Right, so let's actually go through like the different parts of the game so far. So this is this is all the parts you get. Um, I'm just going to kind of break down kind of some of the mechanics and what some of the pieces do. Um, so you play, and you start off with. Let's just zoom in randomly. Um, you start off with the beasts. Um, so there are six beasts in the in the main set. Um, so you place them on, and they create that beast into the world. Um, there are the larger beasts and the smaller beasts. The smaller beast starts off as Six fabulous, larger beasts start off as, oh, sorry, and the smaller beasts start off at three fabulous. Um, so that's a good, good way to start, get some beasts on, get your world starting to build up. Then you have the element blocks. The element blocks make your creatures more fabulous. And this is very necessary because um, if a beast has a more fabulous beast in, el in the world, it will see that beast and it will get jealous. And, you know, jealousy is an ugly emotion, so it will become less fabulous. And if it, if it runs out of fabulousness, then it dies. <laughs> so you have to keep boosting it up, or else your creature will die. And then, and then you'll be sad. You'll just have a pile of bones to look at for the rest of the game, and it won't score you any points. Um, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> um, so these are uh, my great blocks. Um, so when you put these in, you now get a new version of, of an existing beast that lives somewhere else. So, you know, like the shark normally lives in the sea, as they do, um, but you play a migrate block and suddenly you'll get a land shark that runs around on land. Um, and you can boost it with now the land, land elements. So suddenly you've got these like, extra things and you've got these weird things to kind of deal with. Um, so this was actually pointing out these, these ones, which are the cross blocks. Um, so the cross blocks are blocks which um, take two creatures that exist in the world and creates a new creature that's a combination of both of them. So it would take a bear, and it would take an eagle, and it would make some monstrosity that's half bear, half eagle, flying through the air. Um, the graphics are kind of unclear as to whether it has fur or feathers. You'd assume feathers because it's flying. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and these, these are the most dastardly of the pieces. These are the miracle pieces. When you play these, you activate a challenge. Um, and so this challenge is now something that um, will constantly keep going until you fail it or win the game. Um, and if you continue doing this challenge, you get double points for that turn. If you fail it, it goes away. Um, the challenge is something like, hey, now you have a time limit. Hey, now you have to play, put blocks on one-handed. Um, and this is kind of, it's amazing. It's amazing how much more stressful a game gets when suddenly you have like a clock ticking whilst you're doing it. Even if that clock is like, hey, you've got a minute, you've been taking like half a minute on each of your turns, it's not really stressful, you'll probably do this. Already it's ticking, suddenly you make a lot more mistakes. Um, and there's, there's also another thing actually, another mechanic I should mention, which is uh, if you knock the tower over, the game doesn't end immediately. Instead, you have five seconds to rebuild it. Um, now this is, like, the reason I put this in, the reason I really like it, is, is partly so, you know, like, oh, one thing fell off, it's kind of unsatisfying to have that end. But the main reason is, oh, one thing fell off, so you scramble to put it on, and then knock the entire tower over and feel like an idiot. And I'm, whenever I see that happen, I'm like, yes, this is great <laughs> game design. I've made people do something that makes them feel like an idiot, um, and I did that. They're not blaming me, they're blaming themselves. That's what game design is. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so another thing I'm, I am just showing off about like bits of game design I like in this is, is so the game is kind of deliberately designed to, to have as much complexity as you're looking for in it. Like there's kind of complexity in terms of if you put the big pieces on at the same time, they have the same amount of fabulousness so they don't get jealous. So if you did that, maybe that's a good way to 
get, keep, stop them from declining so that you'll get a higher score and you can start thinking that way. But also, kids aren't thinking like that. Kids are just enjoying putting pieces on and seeing cool stuff appear. And, and the game is totally designed to allow that happening. At any one time, you can always play any of the blocks because if you suddenly try to play a block and it goes, ah, oh, no, you can't do this because of the Ujima flip, then it's kind of boring for people who don't care about the Ujima flip. So you can always play any, any block. Um, it just might not do anything useful. Um, you know, um, you can go, some people, some people really like collecting all of the animals. Like, you know, that's, that's a thing that people like in video games, it turns out, <laughs> who knew? Um, so they can collect all the animals, they can get the cool, cool animals. People who like showing off can try putting blocks in really dangerous ways and everyone can yell at them uh, when they eventually fail. Um, people who really care about the strategy of getting the entirely best score can work out the exact right path to put it on to optimize their score. And all of these people can play together at the same time, um, which, which has been this kind of delicate balance of putting these things in, but also letting them sit in the background and come to the fore if you're looking for them whilst not overwhelming each other. And I look forward to continuing work on this game and keeping that delicate balance in there, even as we're trying to add cool new stuff and fix things that have broken the design. Um, and so there's a final other thing, which is, is just the kind of the design of the physical blocks. Uh, this is bare, um, and when people start to play the game, this is generally how they start playing bare. They put bare on the platform, you can see. He looks fine, he's very stable, takes up most of the platform, and has a, has a tiny head. Um, now, as you're playing longer, you start to go, oh, okay, maybe there's other ways to play this. You know, all that matters is the weight. Suddenly you're like, ah, what if I put bare on his face? Suddenly you notice his, his his ass is quite flat. <laughs> so suddenly you've now got a platform on his ass to build up from, and he's perfectly stable. You know, a tripod is the most stable structure. So you're like, okay, cool. We've advanced down the learning curve of this physical piece. And then, and then you look at it a bit longer and you're like, oh, actually, if I put him on his side, you get a flat base on the top, and also it takes up less space at the bottom. Um, and like, it's this kind of nice thing of like, as you're playing with it, you play over multiple games and you start by playing it like kind of normally and then as you get better you learn, oh, these, these things match up. If we played this, then we can start strategizing. And like, I didn't do this. Uh, Tim, who designed all the pieces, kind of put the, all this kind of stuff in. Um, but I really love the fact that there's a learning curve in the physical shape of the piece. Like that, that, that blows my mind. Um, there's also another one that Tim put in which is you can put him kind of balancing like that, and there is a way to balance something flat on top of bare like that. Um, I don't think there's many situations where that's a good good idea, but that's definitely like available to you if it ever comes up, slash if you really want to show off. Um, cool, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much the end. We are on Kickstarter, I'm plugging it again. Um, come back us, just search for Fabulous Beasts and you'll find us. Thanks for all for listening.